Okay, uh, hello guys, uh, welcome to the, the last talk of the day. Also the last talk of the DEFCON 18. Well, uh, I'm Benson and this is uh, Jeremy. Uh, we actually are very surprised that you guys are still here. Uh, you guys didn't, you know, uh, got passed out uh, from last night, crazy uh, Saturday night. Uh, actually, uh, the talk is about a malware analysis. Uh, we first will introduce uh, some very famous malware instance that we have collected and then uh, we will uh, explain how these malware try to uh, fight against uh, anti-malware solutions. And then we propose a method that we call uh, malware long-time forensics that we try to uh, analyze these uh, forensic data on these malwares and then we try to do automatic clustering that help us to identify who is who after all. So as I have introduced, uh, I'm Benson and then it's Jeremy and then uh, another speaker went, actually went back to Santa Clara with our, uh, one of our colleagues. Uh, he actually got so sick on the last day. So uh, Wen was not here. First of all, uh, we actually would like to uh, introduce some Chinese characters. Actually, uh, the character on the uh, upper uh, left corner is actually represents uh, the term malicious in Chinese. And then the first uh, malware sample that we're going to introduce here is actually uh, one of the malicious malware that is very famous called Shops Theater. It actually helps you generate programs that you can steal, username and password from uh, these famous common well-known applications such as Internet Explorer, uh, MSN Messengers or uh, your uh, Firefox. So it's, it's more like a malware generator. The next one is called BFrost. This one is also very famous. It's a very famous uh, bot uh, malware. As you can see uh, on this uh, CNC console, it actually has 28 users connected back to this CNC console. So there are 28 victims. And then the one you see up here, it's a, it's a Chinese version. Uh, it actually derived from the BFrost and uh, it originally derived uh, from BFrost by uh, Chinese hackers and then uh, these characters, uh, if you notice that uh, it's in traditional Chinese rather than simplified Chinese, so uh, got localized by Taiwanese hackers. And then uh, the, the block you see here, it, you can specify where is your CNC console and then whether you want to pack the uh, resulting malware or not. You can also specify if you want to add more plugins such as keyloggers, so on and so forth. So it makes uh, generating a malware that help you steal, uh, not make you uh, infect, infect uh, victims to be a bot very easily. And then the second phrase we're gonna introduce in the talk is called lo ji, uh, lo ji. This one represents chicken. While in DEFCOM you see that the, the war of sheep, well in Chinese hacker community they, they don't call it sheep, they call it chicken. So you actually see a form of chicken instead of war of sheep. And this is the, the war, uh, the form of chicken. Yeah, so obviously you know where, where it came from, right? In the, in the world of ship, we only show a username and password in DEFCOM, but in the form of chicken, you get to see victims' face through the webcam. Okay, and then the modern advanced malware are so powerful that they have so many advanced features. These features including anti blah 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 features such as antivirus, uh, going against anti uh, the antivirus, going against your firewall, uh, and then going against your hips. And then it has more features if you are willing to pay more. 
So if you pay more, you get to enjoy more features that you can put into your uh, malware that you generated. So it's more like a malware as a service in this community. So you can see some uh, features such as, uh, so in addition to antivirus, uh, fighting against uh, antivirus, fighting against firewall, fighting against the heaps, you also have an anti uh, VMware, anti debugger, uh, anti API hookings. So these are the features that once you pay more, you can enjoy. So now we will also talk about uh, how they fight against the sandboxing environment. How they can detect whether they are in the sandboxing environment or not. Uh, these are the approaches that they, they use. Uh, the first one is how they can detect whether they are inside a VM or emulator environment. Usually uh, one approach is that they, they would uh, try to check the, the base address for these IDT and LDT because in, in a normal machine, the IDT and LDT address starts with A something. If it's not starting with this address, then it's probably in a VM environment. And they can also check for the devices because these devices in the VM environment or emulators, for example, the CPU IDs tends to be very unique. The model name tends to be very unique. They also have a very specific PCI device. So if they check against these special hardware specifications, they can recognize whether they are in the VM environment or emulator. And after all, they can also try to launch these backdoor commands because these undocumented backdoor commands are only available when you are inside an emulated environment. So it's very easy for malware to recognize whether they are in a VM environment or emulator. And then in addition to VM emulator detection, they can also check whether they are in a sandboxing Windows environment or not. Because in a sandboxing Windows environment, you tend to have specific service, you tend to have a specific process name. So they can try to check whether the specific process or specific service name are there or not. Also, they can also try to detect these uh, kernel mode SSDT or the user mode API hooking is presented or not. And then after all, uh, the last one is a very trivial one but works very effectively. They actually have a list of uh, legitimate Windows production ID because uh, these vendors, they, ha they have to have legal license of their Windows. So they have a limited set. And this limited set are uh, being collected by hackers community so they know whether they are inside the sandbox or not simply by checking against these legitimate license. So we have introduced how modern malware try to detect whether they are in the sandbox, VM, emulating environment or not. And then what's even more is that uh, they can also try to defeat you even when you try to have monitors, even when you try to hook and then try to detect them. So what they can do is that they can restore the SSDT hook they can also unload the notified routine or process of thread or image or registry. They can also unload this file system filter, restore the FSD hook, unload the TDI filter which is for networking and they can also remove uh, these NTFS attached device. So you can see there are a lot of things they can do, try to unhook you and then try to neutralize your monitors. And then after all, there are also some uh, HIPs. They try to implement their protection layer on the file system level. However, these modern malware, they can also try to launch direct raw DIX access through the DIX.SYS. Then they can bypass your file system protection. So what we try to propose in our talk is actually a behavior analysis and then we try to do forensics. Uh, there are two approaches for behavior analysis. The one is called a network based approach which we will not address in our talk because the approach that we take is actually a host based. 
So uh, for whole space approach, we already mentioned, you either use a VM, you use a sandbox, but as you already know, malware can defeat it these very easily. So what we do is actually use a whole space runtime forensics. So in our runtime forensics, what we did is that uh, we let the malware execute it. And then we try to do forensics after it's already executed. So we collect the snapshot of the environment and then we try to identify the special, special features in that environment. And because we already let the malware execute, we don't have to have monitors to see what happened to the malware during its executions. We also don't have to do hookings either to, uh, through the API or not. So we have nothing for the malware to, be, to defeat us. So you might be wondering, so what kind of features do we try to get uh, when we study this snapshot of an environment? There are three aspects of features that we try to collect, we try to analyze. The first one would be the installation re remnants. These are the, the installation files after the malware try to execute on the system. They either could be startup files, they either could be uh, additional registered keys. We also study the memory layout, try to find some memory block over suspicious DLLs. And then we also try to find if there are suspicious malicious behavior inside the systems. For example, a hidden process, a hidden files. So these are all the symptoms for malicious behavior where a legitimate software would not uh, exhibit on your system normally. And then among the three aspects, uh, we would uh, further explain the one how we study memory layout because this one is the most hardest one to work with. So how we study the memory layout, first we have to, we have to identify which process is suspicious. So the way we identify this one is we first will fetch the process and service list and then we compare against the list, the, the process list that is already inside the system. And we find a difference between these two lists. And then how we, we fetch the process including we scan all the following tables as you can see up here on the slides. And then by doing this, we already identify the hidden process. We already identify the process that is very suspicious. Then we have to further dig into, we have to find which part of this process has the suspicious uh, DLLs. So we, we will fetch the DLLs from the LDR and then we analyze the memory layout, also its structures, scan the code block, I try to find the, the, the code blocks that is, uh, that is, which we'll explain later, how we, we do this part to find the suspicious DLL. So what you see on, on the graph, normally a process will involve a lot of DLLs where they are implicitly linked. But if there is a DLL that is explicitly linked, it's very likely that it's a suspicious DLL. And that is how we identify a suspicious DLL. So that's what we, we call, uh, we check the LDR and then we scan the import table, try to find this suspicious DLL. On the other hand, if the, if the process actually does not load uh, a DLL at wrong time, it actually uh, do some code injection instead. Then our approach is that we will search the memory, try to find this suspicious uh, P image. So uh, in this flow chart you can see that, uh, so let's review. We, we try to identify suspicious process and then we try to identify suspicious DL. And then inside this suspicious DL, we do our runtime forensics, which includes LDR scan, P packer signature checking, code disassembly, string extraction, and then file inspection for hidden files. So these are the, the action items that we do for runtime forensics once we already identify, identify the suspicious memory layout. And then uh, in the following slides, we will introduce some examples that we have collected in the wild 
that uh, use all these kind of uh, anti anti uh, male